Hi everyone. I'd like this to be a bit of an open letter in video format to Ezra Levant, Faith Goldie, and the people at the Rebel.media. Now, for most of my normal subscribers, um, I would imagine this is not a uh, media news source that you uh, particularly appreciate. I have a tendency to have a lot of fairly left-leaning people following me on YouTube. Partially that's probably because I'm an atheist, and I think I'm in a little bit of a small minority group that uh, is atheistic but also quite conservative. Most of my viewpoints are fairly conservative. I do recognize, and I think anybody with, uh, you know, who's being honest would recognize that the majority of the media in the West, in Canada and the USA, are fairly left-leaning. Even if they sort of say that they are hard news and, uh, you know, that they are objective, that they just present the facts and, and you make your own conclusions, uh, a lot of this stuff is begging the question. It's in how the questions themselves are formed that give you a clue as to the ideological leanings of the person reporting or uh, conducting interviews and that sort of thing. And I think if we're honest with ourselves, uh, that is the case. There are very few conser truly conservative, a little bit more on talk radio, but certainly in television or any kind of visual media, there are far fewer conservative media outlets and the ones who are conservative have a tendency to at least a little bit admit their political leanings. Uh, the rebel.media is certainly one of the most honest when it comes to the fact that they are more conservative leaning and that that's the place from which their viewpoints stem. The thing that I appreciate the most about the rebel.media is the fact that they report on a lot of stuff that I don't hear from other sources. Or at least they report on it far far earlier. The Cologne rape attacks, I heard about literally days before any other media outlet on the rebel.media, and I appreciate that. I appreciate them talking about things in ways that aren't talked about in most of the rest of the media. So I think it's important to have that counterpoint. And, you know, I always hear people talking about, ah, oh, multiculturalism is so important, but the one thing that they don't want when it comes to multiculturalism is uh, right-wing culture, right? They don't like conservative culture. They would just as soon all that go the hell away, but all the other stuff can coexist, right? And I think that's a little bit, obviously, um, that's, that's not all that. That doesn't speak to integrity to me when you talk about multiculturalism. In any event, this is meant to be um, a friendly criticism, and it's going to be, I think, fairly harsh criticism. The reason is because I don't want to see the rebel uh, go down this path. I think a specific report by Faith Goldie on assisted suicide is beyond the pale. I think You've jumped the shark here, and this is why I want to send this video in rather than even a letter and explain why. The issue for me, of course, is a lot of the hyperbole used in the interview. She's interviewing someone who's a self-declared activist, so that's fine, and Faith Goldie makes no, uh, makes no bones about her position on the subject, and I'm even okay with that. This is sort of an editorial, if you will. And again, getting back to the sort of mainstream media, what ends up happening is there's a lot of cloaked editorializing. This again, this this creating the 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 uh, impression that they are unbiased, but their bias comes through in the way that questions are framed and that sort of thing. At least here, uh, we're not cloaking it that way. However, what I think is important is at the very least to make a few devil's advocate arguments and to not in overinflate with hyperbole and misrepresentations, your language, when you are even editorializing, right? I think you've got to be a little bit more fair to both sides of the argument. And I think you're going to see what I'm talking about as I go through this. Unfortunately, I've had to make some notes and I don't like normally, I don't script my videos and I don't like having to refer to notes, but in this case, it's very, very important. So to start off with, they do correctly identify the legislation that's being proposed, the different and extensions that are being um, granted here in Canada for assisted suicide, doctor assisted suicide, and that the cases are to be uh, related to severe and irremedial suffering. Now I want you to keep that in mind as we go through this, severe and irremedial. Now there's a couple of things about that. First of all, 
that's fairly clear language. I realize it's also kind of ambiguous. What you know, what con what constitutes severe? It's all subjective, but that's actually also the point. So this isn't just some broad definition. Anybody who's not having a good day can request assisted suicide. Severe and irremedial. Irremedial is fairly clear, but also because it's subjective, I would. I would su suggest that this indicates some kind of um, initiation by the patient themselves, right? Only they can determine what is actually severe in terms of their suffering. Now, Faith Goldie goes on to talk about um, how people are being sort of quote unquote killed and lives cut short um, by this quote unquote license to kill. So we're giving doctors a license to kill. Well, no, we're giving doctors a license or, or a mandate to assist people who are, again, in severe and irremedial suffering. Their lives, sure, literally are cut short, but there's, there's some language here that's being played with, right? Because we understand, too, that if a terrorist uh, kills a 13-year-old girl, that her life was cut short, right? There's no, no attempt there to clarify the language and separate it out from unjustified killing and unrequested killing, right? Uh, and that now, uh, and she interviews Charles Lewis, who it does, they do admit that he is an activist, an anti-euthanasia activist, and I'm fine with that. Let's hear the guy's position, right? But he talks about that now killing patients will become a medical option. And again, I understand Faith Goldie agrees with him. That's her ideological position. But there's no clarification. There's no challenging of that language. That it is a, killing patients is a medical option. Well, we could treat you or we could kill you. And uh, it's a medical option, which means, uh, it, by extension, it's the doctor's discretion as to which method of treatment is used. Uh, treatment for the illness or killing, right? No indication here that this might be initiated by a patient that is suffering severe and irremedial, right? Uh, and that it won't be considered extraordinary. This is, uh, again, Dr. Uh, Charles Lewis saying this, that it won't be considered extraordinary. I think severe and irremedial automatically puts it in the case of extraordinary. What is the percentage of the population that is undergoing severe and irremedial suffering? I guess it's less than... Uh, less than a very small percentage, right? It's already extraordinary. Uh, and that um, some of the doctors who've refused to even give referrals, right? So you might have a doctor who says, listen, I'm not going to assist you in your suicide, but because of my convictions and my beliefs, uh, I'm not even going to refer you to someone who will do it because to me that's aiding and abetting. Now, I understand this actually, and I would not advocate for a doctor being forced to euthanize someone. And I also would not want to be euthanized by a doctor who is doing it under uh, under duress or under protest. I, I, I don't see how I'm going to get the best of care from someone like that. And I even probably agree with them to some degree on the referral thing. Uh, because, of course, you probably can find, as a patient or your family can find, your own referral. You can find a doctor who would be willing to assist you. Um, but he calls it cooperation with evil. And I don't think that, uh, you know, I think Faith could have offered some sort of a, let's play the devil's advocate here and make the case that she knows the other side would make to at least bring back a little bit of a counterpoint there, right? This is a little bit too much editorializing for my taste, uh, especially again with the hyperbolic language that's being used here. Um, because, of course, evil is a different connotation than a doctor who, out of his moral conscience, might be saying, listen, this person is suffering severe and irremedially, uh, irremedial pain and uh, may be infirm, may be incapable of uh, enacting their own suicide, which we're going to get to in a minute. And uh, it is through my conscience that I'm going to help this person. I, I don't see a lot of evil there. And he says, I would want a, con a doctor that follows their conscience. So if a doctor doesn't want to assist someone in their suicide by their own conscience, 
that he, he, that's what he wants. Of course, what he doesn't re, uh, mention there is that a doctor's conscience may also be to assist someone who is suffering severe and irremedial pain. Uh, so he wants a doctor who would follow their conscience as long as their conscience agrees with him. And of course, faith doesn't make that point either, even as a devil's advocate, right? He says, not only are we going to uh, kill people, uh, and this is where our culture is headed. So again, there's this whole idea there that's being floated that this is going to be done regardless of the patient's will. And I don't think that's the intent of the legislation. And the hyperbole is going to get worse when it comes to that, when it comes to this idea that uh, this is not initiated by the patient somehow, that this is going to become just a medical option and that these decisions are going to be made without the patient's uh, input. He's also, they also mentioned that they want to put no age limit on this, and they talk a little bit about minor adults, and Faith uh, mocks the idea of, of minor adults. She says, what are you, a minor or an adult? This is bizarre. It's an arbitrary uh, category, sure, but so are they all. Child is arbitrary, adult is arbitrary, uh, senior is arbitrary. Are you a senior or, or are you an adult, right? Uh, th this is uh, just meant to further subcategorize people into, uh, say, maybe uh, late teens or something like that, because we sort of have a recognition that maybe they're more capable of making decisions for themselves regarding their severe and irremedial pain than maybe an infant would be as to the ramifications of that, what, what it really means to end your life, and maybe a little more capable of understanding death. And it's only because she disagrees with the position ideologically that she mocks this further arbitrary subcategory and really, like I said, all the categories are arbitrary. Who knows exactly when uh, you, be you go from becoming a young adult to an adult or a minor adult to becoming an adult or a an infant to a toddler, etc., etc. Wh which, which moment in time represents your movement from one category to the next? These are broad categories, and they are all arbitrary. Uh... And I would ask the question, too, if we are going to offer people relief from severe and irremedial pain and suffering and disease, why should that not be universalized? Why should only adults be able to access that relief? And I understand all the slippery slope arguments, and I think they're valid. And I think that's why none of this should be entered uh, without, you know, a lot of care and a lot of very careful consideration, a lot of consultation, specifically with people in the medical profession, I think, and, uh, and, and groups that are pro and groups that are con, because they will all, of course, have made their arguments uh, for their case. And we should use other countries who have enacted such legislation where things have gone a little bit south to make sure that we're very, very careful about this. And of course, while they're talking about this doctor-assisted suicide, for whatever reason, they float by an image of a DNR order, which I think is a little bit different than assisted suicide. It's ironic to me because I know that a lot of people ask for do not resuscitate orders on the basis of their religion. They don't want any, um, you know, extraordinary means used to, to extend their life. And really, this whole argument made by Faith Goldie and this, this uh, other fellow is an ideological slash religious one. So it's kind of interesting to me that they would float that by, that graphic by, while they're talking about assisted suicide, which again is a little different than DNR. Um, and then this, this Charles Lewis makes another comment who says, uh, and this is the, the, the misuse of language and insinuation and hyperbole that someone who is uh, writh that the the legislation is made with respect to uh, quote unquote someone writhing in agony with only three days to go and somebody says what's the point? Like that's how flippant people are about helping someone end severe and irremedial suffering, right? And of course. The insinuation there is, again, that it's some third party. Like a guy walking by eating a chocolate bar, glances in the room, uh, in the emergency room, and says, oh, what's the fucking point, right? That this isn't initiated by the patient or the best discretion of a very caring and considerate and professional doctor who abides by his Hippocratic oath and that sort of thing, right? 
I mean, the, and, and again, my, my issue here is not, I'm not making a, a pro-euthanasia point here. Although, I wouldn't say I'm pro-euthanasia, but I'm very, very sympathetic to the plight of someone who is literally a prisoner trapped in their own body, who is undergoing severe and irremedial suffering, who is literally dying without the release of death and who is asking for that release. Interestingly enough, it's actually the literal hell, right? Not being able to escape this severe and irremedial suffering. I'm very, very sympathetic to that. But the point of this video is that the hyperbole and the, the, the insinuations used in this uh, exchange are not even challenged by Faith Goldie as a devil's advocate for the opposite position. Presenting your opponent's position in its best light, addressing the best points of your opposition, rather than sinking to the low of straw man arguments and, and hyperbolic statements, right? That's, that's my issue with this. This is beyond the pale of even editorial reporting, as far as I'm concerned, and it causes me great concern for the direction that the rebel is headed in. Uh, he goes on to talk about other countries where abuses are, are happen, where doctors are not waiting for permission, and even nurses have performed this. Well, I would say that obviously the legislation has to be very careful. And I would think that if nurses are not allowed to perform these things, and they do, that there should be uh, obviously uh, punitive measures taken. I mean, that obviously she shouldn't be a nurse anymore, and she might be, be, should be in jail. I don't understand why that's used as an argument against euthanasia, the fact that some people um, misbehave, right? This happens everywhere. And um, that, that these things start conservative, but then they become killing machines, right? Again, a lot of hyperbole there. Um, Faith makes the point that government, that doctors are government agents. Well, I guess anybody with some sort of a license is a government agent by that stroke. But I think there is a lot of, uh, I think most doctors would, would challenge that point and would say, no, I'm not a government agent. Yes, I require government certification, but I'm not necessarily acting as an agent of the government. I'm acting as an agent for the patient. I think there's some strange connections that are being made there. Um, then they talk about libertarians. What would be the argument to libertarians? What would be the answer to libertarians who say, hey, listen, it's my life. I should be able to do with it what I want. I should be able to end my life if I so choose. And Charles' easy answer for libertarians is, hey, you can still kill yourself. Uh, nobody's going nobody's gonna to prosecute you if you, well, obviously succeed. But even if you fail, you're probably not going to get charged with anything. Uh, nobody can stop you. You're free to do it. Not if you're infirm, idiot. Not if you are incapable, so now I guess only able-bodied people, people have the, the right and the ability to end their severe and irremedial suffering. And I would argue that probably a lot of people who are in the, the literal category of severe and irremedial suffering, probably not capable of committing suicide. Additionally, of course, you have the issue of uh, what commi committing suicide looks like, right? Because there are a lot of, a lot of people fail. I started thinking about this while I was sort of waking up this morning and I started thinking about all the people that I've known in my life that have committed suicide and I started to realize it's actually a big number. Sadly, mostly men, uh, in fact, almost all men, and huh, the way they commit suicide is by uh, hanging. The way they commit suicide is by shotgun to the head or pistol to the head. I do know of several instances of people who have failed in their attempt to commit suicide, one by a uh, shotgun blast to the head, so most of his chin is missing because uh, he failed. And one uh, other person who uh, burned themselves through a sort of a cultural, you know, method, right, of, of committing suicide. And in the majority of all the cases, in fact, I think in almost all of them, uh, the people who hung themselves and shot themselves in the head were found by family members. So you have the compound aspects here of probably pretty a pretty nasty way to go. You're hoping it's instant, but obviously when people fail and blow off half their face and live through it, probably even some of the people who succeed uh, probably don't die right away. Is probably pretty horrific. Definitely the hanging, the people who hang themselves probably don't go right away. Um, 
because it's not usually set up in the way, you know, historically people were, were hanged, right? And the fact that their, their family end up finding them, right? So there's, you know, there's humane and ethical ways maybe to assist someone through that. I don't, I don't think this argument that, hey, you're free to just kill yourself is a good counterpoint to rational, calm, sensitive, considerate, um, you know, very, very carefully thought out doctor assisted suicide for people who are suffering severe and ir irremedial ailments, right? Uh, they say you don't trust the government to take out your garbage, and yet you trust the government with this? Again, to libertarians. Well, no, <laughs> I'm not asking the government to do it. I think I'm going to ask a doctor to do it. There's, You may claim that they are an agent of the government, but when I go into a doctor's office, and when I'm having a, a, a discussion with a doctor about something that's uh, bothering me, I get a level of con care and consideration and compassion and professionalism that I've never seen from uh, walking into a government agent's office, right? Come on. Uh, they say they, they make mistakes, and they actually, uh, they actually equate capital punishment and the botched killings that happened there, or the um, people wrongly accused and put on death row, and then we find out either before they're, uh, before they're killed or after they're killed, that they were actually innocent. So they make mistakes. Well, of course, everything is fraught with mistakes. But there's obviously a difference between capital punishment and a patient-requested assisted suicide, right? Quite a big difference there. Uh, and to equate capital punishment and euthanasia is a little bit silly. And then Faith talks with a smile about botched killings. I, th I find that a little bit weird, especially considering in a minute we're going to talk about how they talk about uh, people applauding when discussing uh, changes in the law to allow euthanasia. She talks with a weird smile about the botched killings. Oh, there's botched everything. You can go for a butt implant and die on the operating table, right? There's botched, uh, botched procedures all the time. Uh, and she's equating this again to the botched killings in capital punishment cases, but she doesn't provide any numbers. I mean, what, what are the numbers of botched, you know, she talks about uh, anesthesiologists relating to awakenings that people, you know, have during, uh, during a, a euthanasia procedure. But she doesn't offer any numbers, any statistics. What is it, a tenth of a percent, a hundredth of a percent, ten percent, eighty percent? That's kind of important, right? Especially if you're going to talk about a realistic reporting, even in an editorializing fashion, even when you're making an ideological position, you kind of should know that if you're going to make that point. Otherwise, you're misleading people. Maybe intentionally, I don't know. Um, and then he talks about how the demographics, uh, the people have shifted to now where there's sort of an 80% roughly support for assist doctor-assisted suicide. And he says, I don't know what happened. And he equates this shift to opposition to religion, that basically he's saying that the reason that people are now 80% in, in favor of doctor-assisted suicide is because they see it as a religious issue and people are becoming more irreligious, so it's a pushback against religious people opposing, imposing their views on them. And again, if you know, somebody should say, well, now that may not be addressing the best of their argument. It could be because 80% of the people recognize uh, and have some compassion for people who are, again, as I said earlier, a prisoner in their own body, who are physically incapable of ending their own suffering, and who are suffering severe and irremedial uh, maladies, right? That that might be, it might be the compassion and the empathy that people have for others that is motivating this shift, right? Uh, for a little comic relief, I'll quote this, this Charles guy. Um, he talked about Bill Maher, I think he meant Bill Maher, having a tete-a-tete -tete with someone else. I think he meant a tete-a-tete, -tete. but anyway. Um, and he was talking about all the, I don't know, the improvements in California or something like that, Bill Maher was, and he said, and now we've made assisted suicide legal. And he says, and this guy says, the crowd went nuts. And Faith Goldie says, weird. And, um, and uh, 
He says, you know, no, this is nothing to applaud about. They're all smiling. They're smiling about people being put to death. Again, this is this language that faith doesn't, you know, nobody sort of says, well, okay, being put to death, that's pretty hyperbolic. They're asking, right? If I commit suicide, am I being put to death? Right? And if I'm infirm and I request someone assist me with that because I'm suffering severe and irremedial, right? Am I being put to death? This is this language that I think is irresponsible, even for an editorial style um, interview, right? He said it was truly a creepy moment. The reason that they're applauding, I would suggest, is because they recognize the compassion of helping someone end their literal hell. Faith said, uh, when a society gleefully embraces the idea of creating almost a duty to die for the most vulnerable in that society, what does that society look like? Gleefully embracing the idea of a duty to die. I don't think that's the spirit of the proponents of doctor-assisted suicide. I don't think that's the spirit of the legislation. Maybe I'm wrong, but I think that's irresponsible uh, to frame it in that way. Don't worry, it gets worse. And I would ask Faith Goldie, what makes someone vulnerable in that situation? In a compassionate society, are they vulnerable to other members of that society, or are they vulnerable to their severe and irremedial condition? <laughs> That's what makes them vulnerable. That's their vulnerability. It's interesting to me, through this whole thing, they never seem to address that position. What it must be like to be literally a prisoner trapped in your own body that is defying you with chronic, severe pain and the inability to do anything about it in a system where we still don't have an answer and a remedy for their condition. What that must be like to be trapped and not be able to have the ultimate release from that. They don't address that. They wanna make all the slippery slope arguments and I think, again, they're valid. When it comes to something like this, all slippery slope arguments should be addressed so that we make sure we're very, very careful about whatever legislation comes about. And wait for it, his answer to what does this society look like when people gleefully embrace the duty to die among the most vulnerable? Yeah, he relates it to Nazism. He relates it to Hitler and the Nazis. He says that the society begins to believe, and then as he quotes them, uh, that there are certain useless eaters. Again, insinuating that this isn't initiated somehow by the patient or by the people who know the patient best if they're not able to communicate it very well or by a professional medical a person in the medical field who's able to ascertain some of these uh, things. That this, is a, that this is done because society has decided that this person is a waste of time rather than that this is initiated out of compassion for that person, that is specifically for that person, that we are embarking on this. And no counterpoint, no even devil's advocate arguments by Faith Goldie. It's not very good. Uh, and that we stop caring about the most vulnerable. The whole point is that this, in this is that we are caring about the most vulnerable. That's the whole point. Uh, and then he goes into a personal anecdote about he had some spinal thing, which clearly was not irremedial because he's uh, sitting upright having a conversation and he talks about how he had to give up biking and, I don't know, hiking and traveling. This is not the category for you, dude. All right. Uh, and that people just say, ah, maybe they should die. Um, I think, again, this is misframing the argument, right? And not addressing the best of the people, the proponents for doctor-assisted suicides arguments. Because I guarantee you, it's not done because they think, oh, there's a bunch of useless eaters here, which we should kill, maybe they should die. It's initiated by care and consideration and compassion for the patient. Uh, and as I said, I, I think slippery silk arguments definitely need to be uh, addressed carefully, but I don't think prohibition is the answer to all of this because then again, we're ignoring the plight of those people, right? And then he's got another anecdote of some girl with lupus and their family said, she said she wants to die and the, God, the, the family flippantly said apparently, oh, good idea, you can avoid a lot of suffering. 
Not, we don't want to lose you, but we understand what you're going through. If you tell us that this is unbearable, out of compassion, we will support your decision as much as it pains us, as much as we cannot bear the thought of losing you, right? You see what I'm saying here? And the doctor refused. He said, listen, lupus is treatable. I think we can uh, come up with some, uh, some answers for you. And uh, the girl goes home and hangs herself. And the, the family, and qu quoting this Charles guy again, instead of grieving like normal people, they uh, blame the doctor. And they're suing him for the fact that they're, you know, for mental anguish that they had to go through and not probably finding their daughter hung, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I don't think there's any good answer to a scenario like that, right? But it's unfair to characterize this family in that way, to say instead of grieving like normal people, how cold and heartless were those, was that family, right? They just saw a chance for litigation here. Again, Faith, your job was to counter that a little bit and say, well, people might say, devil's advocate here, um, you know, is it fair to characterize that family in that way? To basically characterize them as though they don't care about their daughter. Um, he admitted that he exists on faith because he's a Catholic, I guess. And he said it's true. So I appreciate an, an honest admission there. And then he goes on to talk about how in all these other countries, um, doctor-assisted suicide has been a slippery slope and it's resulted in some bad things. So he said anyone who is a proponent of doctor-assisted suicide who thinks that the slippery slope won't happen here in Canada is operating on faith too. Too cool, okay? I don't know. Um, so it's not possible we could learn from their mistakes, right? It's not possible that we could craft very careful legislation based on what we have gleaned from the mistakes made elsewhere. We can't attempt to be more rational. We just have to enact a prohibition that ensures the continued suffering of people with chronic and irremedial conditions. Uh, God, uh, Faith at one point said, God doesn't even need to factor into this whatsoever. You know, this is a... This is a... He also says at the end, you know, write your write your um, your MLA or whatever and uh, if you if you disagree with doctor assisted suicide he says use anecdotes uh, if you want you know that's a good idea let them know your discontent well how are the pro uh, doctor assisted suicide people supposed to support the motion uh, with with similar anecdotes right so you can have a family sure that says uh, hey listen uh, or a person who says listen I was gonna request doctor assisted suicide I didn't see a way out and um, I chose against it or my doctor disagreed or it was illegal at the time or whatever and I didn't do it and I'm glad I didn't do it now because it turns out my what I thought was a chronic and, and severe and irremedial condition turned out not to be I got treatment I'm better now or whatever but you're not gonna have any anecdotes from the people who say that was the best decision I could have possibly made. I'm so glad that I did because the pain was unbearable. I couldn't bear, bear to exist moment to moment and I finally got relief for that, right? No recognition of that. The final thing I wanna say about this is I understand that this is actually, this is a religious and ideological argument I think on the point of the people at Rebel and uh, the person that they're interviewing, he admits as much. And there's an interesting juxtaposition here. He talks about the moral argument, but of course the moral argument is an ideologically moral argument. It's from a position of his faith, his religion. And I, I would imagine so on the point of Faith Goldie, although she didn't say as much. And uh, that they're now juxtaposing this with a 80% acceptance of doctor assisted suicide across the country and i said this before but i think you know people have to be very careful with these uh, freedom of religion sort of ideas and utilizing that for the basis of law because again if you're going to do that and you're going to have a multicultural society where you tell everyone they have the freedom of religion you're still making a choice there as to which religion you're going to sort of base your laws on right I think, first of all, if you're going to expect other people to abide by the notions that you have of 
morality and law based on your religion, you kind of should demonstrate that your religion is an accurate representation of the nature of our existence before you expect other people to abide by those laws. Otherwise, I think you're down to, uh, now how do you juxtapose that with your multicultural society and the religion and the different religious beliefs of all the other people in it? Do you then, uh, again, go by a tyranny of the majority? Well, there's more people of our religion than your religion in this country, so therefore we trump you. Be very careful, shifting demographics, as we see in places in Europe, may put you in the minority, and um, if you're going to make that case based on that, you're going to be have to be subject to that, lest you be, right, completely uh, um, hypocritical. That I think, obviously, these arguments and, and law in a secular society needs to be made by rational, empirical, carefully constructed arguments that don't rely on faith in something that you can't see or prove. And it's just a weird mosaic, I think, that you paint when you talk about freedom of religion and then you attempt to utilize the ideological points from your religion, the moral cases from your religion, to enact or challenge legislation. The, that can't coexist with all the other freedoms of all the other religions that you talk about. But ultimately, I want to get back to the main point of this video, to Ezra Levant, to Faith Goldie, to all the people at the rebel.media. I appreciate your conservative views. I appreciate your honesty about your conservative views and your editorializing. I appreciate, because that exists on the left to a much larger degree. I appreciate your bringing hard news when you do especially when you bring it either by yourself, because none of the left-wing media will actually even report on certain things, or much earlier than the left-wing media is often, you know, finally forced to bring about. But I would like you to not jump the shark here. Don't destroy a good thing that you have going. Make sure that you're careful. I would suggest addressing the best of your opposition's arguments instead of the least Make a few devil's advocate arguments that you know, and make them reasonably. Don't just say, hey, what about libertarians who say, um, you know, it's my body, I should be able to do with what I want to. And when your interviewee says, oh yeah, but you can just kill yourself anyway, address that and say, yeah, but not everyone can do that. And that's not always the most um, humane way to go, to just say, hey, fucking kill yourself, right? Be, be careful, I think, about the direction that you're heading, because I think you're a valuable resource, and I appreciate most of what you do, but that one was beyond the pale, and I think it's time for a little bit of introspection. Maybe I'm way off base here, but um, that's my request. Think about that a little bit. Thanks very much for watching.